can we'll host to spotlight, me. Um, spotlight. You're on Facebook right now. You might want to stop. No, she's all right. It, it's okay. She's gonna. She's gonna stand spotlight. where you are, right? Uh, yeah. Do that yeah, so yeah, you're fine. We're live right now. Okay. There you go. Okay. Good morning, everybody on Facebook. Thank you for your patience as we get started here this morning. We are in the middle of our Sunday metaphysical service, and I would like to introduce Reverend Diana Fidel right now, who will be doing the reading and homily this morning, and it is called The Improbable Dream. Thank you, Reverend Amanda. I look very white in that. Is that, is that way too white? The lighting. So thanks for your patience, everybody, um, as we're for the first time or this, we've got new technology here in the community room at the Southside Mall. So welcome to us here. Um, the reading today is from a book called Following Atticus by Tom Ryan. Okay. The book is about Tom Ryan, who's a middle-aged overweight newspaper man with a fear of heights, who decided to hike all 48 of New Hampshire's 4,000 foot peaks twice in one winter while raising money for charity to pay tribute to a good friend who died of cancer. You could drop it right now. Okay. He brought along his dog companion, Atticus, a miniature schnauzer, and amidst this enchanting but dangerous winter hike, he and his dog share an extraordinary relationship. And um, go to the book, the quote from the book. We were happily skipping down Mount Pemigewasset when we encountered the tiniest rodent I've ever seen. It was sitting on a rock in the middle of the trail and was frozen with fright when my size 12 hiking shoe nearly smashed it into mouse heaven. For the means of convenience, I will refer to him as Templeton. I stopped short and Atticus sat nicely by as we stood, uh, took stock of Templeton and Templeton stopped quivering and appeared to be taking stock of us in return. I snapped a photo of Atticus and Templeton together, then offered the little rodent a small square of cheese that was as big as he was. I was delighted when he accepted and took tiny bites while, while I held it. In my clumsy attempt to get a better photo of Templeton and Atticus sitting facing one another, I frightened the mouse and he ran off and found refuge in the most unlikely of places, between Atticus's legs. It was unlikely because miniature schnauzers are terriers that were bred for ratting. It's one of the reasons Attic Atticus always chased squirrels. So Templeton's choice of a safe haven was ironic to say the least. So, so some other, e under some other dog, Templeton would have ended up a nice snack. And even under Atticus of old, he would have been less than a mouthful of savory, crunchy fare. The previous November on the Avalon Trail, Atticus stood above me as I struggled with my Lyme disease on a hike. He had a nearly dead mouse dangling from his mouth. I was strangely saddened to see him taking the life from a creature of the mountains and asked him to release it. As he did, it hit the snow and writhed in pain. I slid on a heavy glove and held the mouse in my hand so it didn't have to die in the cold snow while Atticus sat next to me looking down on it. We had a man to dog talk that day, centering on reverence for life. And I tried to explain to him that what he'd done was not cool and that I wished he wouldn't do it again. I reminded him that we were only guests in the mountains. Now, had anyone encountered us that day, we would have been a strange sight, a man, holding a mouse, talking to a dog about reverence. <laughs> but that's the way Atticus and I went through life. And strangely enough, it worked for us. We stayed with that mouse until it stopped moving and then laid it to rest. Some may think that, think that was a silly thing to do since a dog like Atticus was bred for such things. But little did I know that our gentle talk that day would mean something to him. 
for not only did he not kill Templeton, he allowed him to find shelter beneath him and simply sat looking down on him in a curious manner for several minutes. Templeton evidently felt very safe for he sat there nonchalantly cleaning himself after his meal. We all stayed that way for quite some time. I wasn't really sure what to think of Atticus that day. I'd always known he was different, but it was one of those moments that surprised even me. Atticus had broken the chain. For generations, the traits of Atticus's breed had been carried forth and it was instinctual for him to go after rodents. And yet under the trees on the side of Mount Pemigewasset, he chose not to. He had accomplished what most people fail to do, change. That was an expert excerpt from Following Atticus by Tom Ryan. Good morning. Don't we all wish we could change some of ourselves instantaneously like Atticus the dog did? And we were talking today about creating spiritual change in ourselves. We will consider change, the why, what, and how of change, and how we actually create the change we want to see. Here at the Institute for Spiritual Development in Oneonta, we are observing our fifth anniversary, five years. We, our very first service was on March 19th, 2017. Where's the time go? There were about 30 people attending what we called our exploration on the yellow brick road, my sister Sue's idea. And Carla Finn sang and played guitar and Marilyn Roper, may she rest in peace, accompanied our awkward hymn singing on the keyboard. Many of you were there. Um, is there a show of hands on Zoom? And if you were there, at that first service. We have one here in our room. How many on the, Sally was probably there. So we may have had three or four on Zoom. <clears throat> My sister, Sue Landon, who co-founded ISD Oneonta with me um, and Tom Landon, our silent partner. <laughs> she and I were about to launch a class called The Fine Art of Talking to Dead People. <laughs> my, my sister's unconventional sense of humor shining through in that class title. I think we ended up changing the title finally. Um, five years of Sunday services, four newly trained ministers and ordained, and hundreds of spiritually changed people later. Here we are getting ready for our fifth annual convention of all members that Amanda was mentioning earlier on April 3rd at 12 noon, which will be on Zoom entirely. All are invited to attend. We will look over our progress for last year and it's your chance to have your voices heard. We would not have crossed this threshold if it were not for all of you who each played a part in sculpting what ISD has become. So thank you for picking up the baton when it was your turn to take a couple of laps all of those laps brought us to where we are today and what incredible changes we've seen. So back to the topic at hand, the improbability of change, much of, um, much of which I'm taking directly from my sister Sue's homily. And for those of you who may not know, my sister Sue Landon and, and uh, co-founder passed away a little over a year ago. We, we don't think this was her first homily on that auspicious day, but we don't have a record of what it was. So if you remember, let me know. Very first one. We all have things about, we all have things about our lives that we want to alter, modify or, trans, um, or transfer. I don't think transfer is the right word. We attend these services, development circles and take classes because we are interested in spiritual growth. David Hawkins was a mystic and spiritual teacher that many of you are familiar with, who wrote the book, Power Versus Force. He, he did pass away in 2012, I found out. He taught that spiritual growth is the most basic and profound means of allevi alleviating suffering in this world. 
He created a scale that tells us that all of humanity can be measured in spiritual growth. In this scale of spiritual consciousness, simplistically stated, the, the levels range from number one, you are a rock, all the way to a thousand, a state of enlightenment attained by Buddha, Christ, or Krishna. The scale starts at the bottom with shame and guilt and rises up through fear, pride, willingness, acceptance, love, peace, and enlightenment at the top. But he says that 99% of all people never change more than five points. 95% of people don't change. They simply don't. Do not. Not going to do it. Can't make me. That's almost all people. But we here at ISD are interested in spiritual growth. It distinguishes us. This is a church and a school that explores the relationship between humanity, the divine, and the individual. It is a church of exploration, not dictation. We're explorers, but at the same time, I have a dream. This is, this is Sue's words I'm reading from. Sorry. I have a dream that one day I'm going to live in an RV and wear a bathrobe all day with curlers in my hair, drinking beer, smoking cigarettes, playing cards with the neighbors and talking about my soap operas. <laughs> That's my dream. It sounds a whole lot easier, doesn't it? Living a life that's easy without any challenges or commitments and doesn't require change. That was Sue's dream. I think everybody probably has their own. Mine, mine would be living, living in a hotel room, getting room service, watching Lifetime movies and, and doing puzzles. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there would have to be a hot tub and a glass of wine involved. <laughs> but, but why do we want to change? Because something happened that led us here. And what happened is you got spoken to by spirit, capital S. You had an experience of spirit firsthand, and it altered the course of your life. You stepped out of the 99% who do not change. You made a very powerful priority that cannot be denied. We're talking about change, and now we know why. <clears throat> but what do we want to change? <clears throat> I'm stepping out of my sister Sue Landon's words now for a, a moment, um, and we will return. But for those of you who never met my sister Sue, she was the one who, and though everybody else who does knows this very clearly, um, she always led the, the cutting edge, led the way in cutting edge spiritual and holistic practices in our family and with her friends. In other words, she was kind of the weird one in the family or the eccentric one. Some of you play that role in your own families, I know. And, and in the late seventies and early eighties, she convinced our whole family, including my parents to take the S training, a self-help seminar. Some of you know about the S training. Yeah. Yeah. May have taken it yourself. And um, the, the purpose of which was to transform one's ability to experience living so that the situations one had been trying to change or had been putting up with clear up just in the process of life itself. It was kind of our first foray into looking at life through, through some spiritual lenses. So spiritual change hit us early in the new age movement. So back to Sue's words. We're talking about change, and now we know why. But what do we want to change? Oh, Lordy, don't get me started, right? Our spiritual goals might include something like this if we pick from other religions. From the Buddhists, mindfulness, paying attention. From Judaism, find a way to be a good person all the time. From the Tao, balance. From the Sufis, self-realization from Islam, Tawid, or unity with God, from transcendentalism, a closer alignment with our intuitive senses, from the Hindus, all life is sacred, 
from Native Americans, love, honor, respect for all living things. So the bottom line on that shopping list of qualities we are looking for in leading a spiritual life, what, what's the what of what we want to change? We seek to find the presence of the divine in everyday life consistently. That's what we want to change. Not just when we're happy, not just when we got a raise, not just when everybody is agreeing with you, not just when we're sitting in the hot tub, not just when all the lights are green, consistently finding the presence of God when we fail, when those around us fail, when we are injured, hurt, small, petty, angry, finding the presence of God when those we love betray us, leave us, or worst of all, die. Finding the presence of God when everything else around us falls apart. Quote from David Hawkins, the mystical spiritual teacher. The seeking of enlightenment is a very major commitment and is in fact, the most difficult of all human pursuits, end quote. 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christian, according to ABC News. When Sue wrote this, by the way, it was 83%. Currently it's gone, less people identify themselves as Christians in the US. 21% are non-religious, 4% all other, Jewish, Muslim, Taoist, Wiccan, Unitarian Universalists, mm -hmm. et cetera, and down, are, are down there in that 4%. The all other is, is in there, in there is us also, the metaphysicians. Those who have made a major commitment to the most difficult of all human pursuits, the seeking of enlightenment, seeking the presence of the divine with consistency which requires personal change. <clears throat> so to sum up the category, why do we want to change? Because we know ourselves to be spiritual beings. What do we want to change? The consistency with which we experience our spiritual selves. And the last point we wanted to address the how, how do you change spiritually? Well, if spiritual growth is the most difficult thing we can take on, and the requirement for spiritual growth is personal change, it makes it a pretty big question. It also makes me tired. And everybody has an answer. I had a professor in college who used to put, who used to talk about McDonald's hamburgers. Remember when they used to put on the signs, three million sold? And he used to say, three million sold to Eaton. And there are three million answers to the question of how to change, but only two people following their own advice. Because it's really pretty simple and doesn't require much. Of God, being of God equals peaceful. Being not of God equals fear and anger. Anita Morjani, the author who talks about having gone to heaven in a near-death experience, says that if she had to sum up everything she learned about why she had cancer and nearly died, it would be fear. And the message she brought back, live your life fearlessly. How would your life look if you were living it fearlessly? How would today look if you were living it fearlessly? Might be the painting of your life had a lot more color in it. Might be that change would come to you as easily as it came to Atticus. Might be that you'd find a little more humor in life's ups and downs and a little more joy, a little more serenity. And when we are living fearlessly, the doors are thrown open to knowing that we do want to change. And it's ongoing. 
that we know exactly what we want to change and exactly how we are going to change it. And with the support of many classes and mentors and circles and services like this at ISD, it helps, it helps that process. Because in that space, we feel the presence of God and we know when the presence of God is missing. I'll end with a quote from Lao Tzu. If you are depressed, you're living in the past. If you are anxious, you are living in the future. If you are at peace, you are living in the present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. That was so beautiful. Yeah. We are going to end the Facebook portion of the service right now. And if anybody's interested in seeing past homilies or homilies after we present them, you can check out our YouTube channel at uh, Institute for Spiritual Development Oniana on YouTube. Thank you guys very much. Have an excellent rest of your Sunday and happy spring.